The time is 4 o'clock in the morning on January 5th of the year 2000. Several police officers and civilians witness a massive triangular shaped object and it moves aerodynamically like no aircraft known to the common man. What follows is a detailed reconstruction and analysis of what constitutes a landmark UFO sighting. The story is retold by the actual witnesses and incorporates the actual police radio transmission tapes from that cold January morning. I got in here about 4 o'clock in the morning, and as I got out of my pickup truck, I happened to look over in the northeast, and I seen that bright star, which I thought it was a star, shining down this way. So I goes in the inside, was in there for a few minutes, and came back out to get in my truck, and I looked over there again, and I uh, thought to myself, oh, that's awful bright and awful low, and I just kept watching it, and all once I said, it's moving. So I kept my eyes on it, and I just, as it came into the city of Highland here, over these trees right here, I could see under it, it was like a custard red lights, and it was like a two-story house with a little penthouse on top, and had, oh, I don't know, six or eight windows in it, and there was a just a bright light on the inside, but all the same, and as it was traveling so slow, right over these treetops, it just kept them moving and I was just standing here watching it going out of Highland and there was windows in the back of it and I thought to myself that I, I could barely see it well there would be nobody would believe me what I seen if I don't tell somebody so I figured well I'll go down to the police station and uh, to see if they could see anything well, I just received a call from Highland PD reference to a truck driver just stopped in he said there was a flying object in the area of Lebanon. It was like a two-story house. It had white lights and red blinking lights, and it was last seen southwest over Lebanon. Leslie, could you check the area? I asked CENTCOM if they were joking, because again, I joke around with some of the dispatchers there, and they said negative. It's a joke, right? No, this is not a joke. I just got off the phone with Nancy from Island PD. It's like, okay, so I asked him if the person reporting was 1055, which means DUI or drunk. Uh, or did they say if the truck driver was uh, DUI or anything? And they said no. He said he was serious. Uh, 10 4 not. Now, during this whole time, while driving out here, I'm kind of going back and forth to St. Clair County. Ask them, well, what am I supposed to do if I find it, you know, that kind of thing. And Just a quick question. If I happen to find it, what am I supposed to do with it? They asked me if I wanted the number for the UFO hotline. I said negative. Even if I saw it, I'm not going to report it. If I see it, I'm not saying a word. I just like change my mind about that. But... Uh, also be advised, about the last thing that went over Lebanon, this was approximately five minutes ago, was a military cargo plane. It looked like a C-5. The uh, air recognition lights got green, red, and also white. Right in here, when I first saw, again, the double lights, that would have been a little to the left of the one street light and the red flashing light, which is the radio tower out at Summerfield, about two meters to the left of the flashing red radio tower. They were almost touching and they were so bright. It, at first, it almost looked like car headlights on brights, but they were bigger and brighter than the uh, like street lights that the farmers have around their houses and so forth. Well, I called CENTCOM to let them know what it was I saw and that I was going to investigate. Be advised, there's a very bright white light east of town. Looks like it's just east of Summerfield, and it keeps changing colors. I'll go there and see if maybe it's an aircraft. It doesn't look like an aircraft, though. And then I did really speed up that time because I wasn't sure exactly what it was I was seeing. It was, it was at that point when I turned on my overhead emergency lights because again and my rig rack flashers because I wasn't sure whether it was a plane going down or not. When I next saw it, it, would, it had turned from two into one, again gigantic bright light and during all this including when it was the two there was white light radiating off of it almost like the Japanese uh, rising sun battle flag. 
Okay, we're now coming up. I'm getting ready to turn the east route. Okay. When I got to the bridge at the very east end of town, it had turned into like an elongated cigar. Again, very intense bright light with the white light radiating off of, radiating off of it. I still had my overheads on, continuing towards Summerfield, which is eastbound, and it was still at about the one, two o'clock position from where I was at. You would, would you contact Scott Air Force Base to see if they have anything flying in this area, please? It was right here when I noticed that it looked like it was coming towards me. The light appeared to be getting bigger, that's all why I thought it was definitely moving. It was kind of moving from my right to the left. When I saw it was definitely moving towards me, I pulled over to the side of the road. And right where I pulled over, there's a sign that says, test pavement next 21 miles, big green sign. I turned off the overhead lights, the headlights, turned off the car, and got out of the car on the driver's side. I was standing over here when it got closer. That's when I was able to discern the, the actual shape, the triangle, and so forth. And when it got about approximately 150, 200 foot south of my location and about 1,500 foot high off the ground is when it made the flat turn, started heading southwest again very, very slowly, almost almost like a floating or a moving hover. Uh, I reached back in the car, picked up my radio to tell CENTCOM where it was at and so forth. And when I looked up again, which is based about two to three seconds, it was already over Shiloh, which is about six to seven miles to the southwest. 10 4 well, whether it's a plane or not, it's heading westbound now. It should be really close to Scott now. Matter of fact, if the shadow officer looks up, they can probably see it by now. 2550, I see something, but I don't know what that is. On January 5th, about 4.30 in the morning, Ledman gets a call for this flying object. And after he had seen it and said that it might be in Shiloh or Lebanon, I'm driving right here, eastbound on Lebanon Avenue, and right in this field is where I observed it. Tencom 5404. I had looked up in the sky and observed this huge arrow-shaped, triangular-shaped object just floating in the sky right in the open field right over here and it had three big bright lights lighting up the entire sky just beneath the flying object and it was just floating gradually west southerly along this field over here <clears throat> at a gradual slow speed and as I stopped right up the road here to get out and see if I could get a picture or observe it better the object with unexplainably in the naked eye was just from gradually moving to all the way down in the field like within the snap of a finger or a, a wink of the eye and, and there was no sound I had my window down uh, the radio was off and there was no sounds no nothing coming from the flying object and it was every bit of 75 to 100 yards that appeared to be wide I didn't get a very good look at the length wise. Next thing you know, it just was down the road. Sincom 604. Go ahead. I've got that object inside also. Are you serious? It's huge. 104. And that's when I first saw it. It was a huge object. It was an arrowhead shaped object. It's concave in, in the rear, and it was huge. For the size of the object, it was moving very slowly. Only about 500 to 1,000 feet off the ground. It was very low, so I got a real good look at it. There were three lights to the rear of the object, uh, one in the center and, and one on either side, on the right and left side. And then in, in the center of the rear, in the concave section, it was like a strobing white light that got bright and then dimmed off as, as the the strobing effect went across. Um, then on the bottom center of the object, I observed it was a, a red blinking light. It headed straight to the north, and then as it banked, it made a distinct tilt, and then it, it turned and went toward the uh, St. Louis Dupont direction, which would be to the northwest. So the, you saw a distinct bank? Yes. It, it didn't sway in the wind or or anything like, like a blimp possibly would. So I hopped out of my patrol car, went to the rear of the trunk, 
grabbed the Polaroid and snapped a quick picture of it as it headed to the north. What does it look like to you? It's kind of V-shaped. Uh, looks like it's possibly headed toward uh, Lambert. Snapped the picture, it was cold out, and the Polaroid camera didn't work real well and with the coldness and, and being just a Polaroid camera, and not real good night, but... Then come 604. Go ahead, 604. Does Dupo have a Polaroid? Uh, that I don't know. From the time they told me that Milstad had seen it, I drove probably about five miles down the highway and pulled off the side of the road to look, and another officer from a neighboring town came up, and I told him what I was doing. We both laughed about it and made a few jokes, and he left, and I got back in my car and went maybe a quarter mile, and I seen something in the sky. And then, you know, before I'd seen a couple of little planes, because Parks Airport's about five miles from here, they were coming in, but then after I seen this other object, it didn't appear to be like any plane I'd seen before. 604, 3923 on County 2. 604, Ben. I'm not sure this thing, item that you said, it's one here appears to be pretty high in the area. I first seen it, I look at it because you can see the different colors, now it just appears to be white. Very large. It's hard to tell, it's pretty far off in the distance. I looked at it with binoculars, it looked a lot brighter, the lights were a lot more. I guess had a lot more brightness to them than a regular aircraft would. And about that time, the dispatcher called me back again. I don't know if I still seen the object. And I said yes. And she said that Lambert Airport's on the phone. They said there's nothing in the area around you. This object was above me about 500 feet. And it was huge. Yeah, it's, uh, it's usually the planes are. It's not low at all. I couldn't tell exactly how far it was. It's a pretty dark night and. I was looking with binoculars, but it was definitely off to the east pretty far. The UFO took its course through Highland, Illinois at approximately 4 a.m. It then moved southwest toward the town of Summerfield, where it was spotted by Lebanon police at 418. It then approached the police officer at 423, where it then shot suddenly to Shiloh six miles away in two to four seconds, and then moved southwest. The UFO then moved to the town of Milstadt, where it was seen at 4.28 a.m. local police time, where it then took a northwesterly direction and was then spotted by an officer of the Dupo Police Department at 5.03 a.m., where he observed the object turn back to the east. This is St. Clair County, Illinois, a conservative farming community. People here are hardworking, religious, and private. The notion that the witnesses of this UFO would fabricate a hoax or even misidentify a commonly known aircraft is not even worth considering. There's no doubt that the witnesses of this UFO saw a triangular-shaped aircraft, approximately a football field in length, and it moved in total silence. On two occasions, it achieved a rate of speed which left the witnesses dumbfounded and unable to understand how a massive object could relocate itself miles away in a matter of seconds. Maybe two to three seconds tops. Two to three seconds tops. Because the case I was outside, I was watching, then I reached in to get the mic, again to let CENCOM know because our portables aren't that reliable. And when I got back up to tell him, I looked and it it was already over Shiloh, and that's about six to seven miles away, which again was approximately one and a half, two miles north of Scott Air Force Base. Uh, the whole time I saw it, I had my windows rolled down, and I, had, I didn't have the radio going or nothing like that. And the thing, it, it was just like, it was just a slowly, it was just like a slow moving when I saw it. And I was only at the time going probably about 20 miles an hour or so in my car. And as I pulled over to get out of my car, it was like just within the snap of the finger, it was way down, you know, way down the other side of town. And, you know, I just stood there and looked at myself, you know, I'm like, okay, it was just here, and now it's way down there. How did it do that? And it was amazing. And there was no and sound? Not a sound at all. None whatsoever.
uh, there was no way to to uh, have that to be that low without hearing something. Even if they were gliding in, I mean, there, there would have been noise. I mean, the wind, you could hear the wind from it. And so on all this here, it was so quiet. I mean, nothing. Even the treetops didn't even move because I looked and there was nothing. And so if you wouldn't have been looking up, you wouldn't even know it had been going over you. I, I never shut my patrol car off at any time, but I did exit my vehicle when I took the picture, and, and I could hear coming from the vehicle, it was a low-frequency buzzing noise, uh, almost sound like a low-frequency, like a, a transformer on an electrical pole would make, only a little lower decibel than that. I could hear as, as, it, as it passed. As it went off, I, you know, lost the sense of the sound, of course. But. Being a military brat for 21 years, and being an aircraft anyways, I can pretty much tell you what kind of plane it is by the engine noise. And then I figured I would call Scott myself and say, hey, look, you know, we got some pilot hot dogging out here, that kind of thing. And there was no noise, none. And when I read reports that the military was saying, well, if it was a B2 with its flaps down, blah, 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 well, okay, that's fine, but they still make noise. I mean, that's, that's the most, but yeah, they, you can't see them on radar, but they make noise, all aircraft that I know of. And again, I don't know of all the R&D aircraft. However, all the ones that I do know of, they make some kind of noise. The witnesses testified that the UFO was enormous in size, as large or larger than a 747 jetliner, which is 231.9 feet in length. The notion that the UFO was a B-2 bomber, which, although it has a wide wingspan of 172 feet, is only 69 feet long. The B-2 can be ruled out as a possible explanation. Where I was, I was on a, on a high a hilltop, and it was an open field, so, you know, there was nothing, you know, that could obscure my view. I mean, it was very clear sight. I could actually tell, like, some kind of figures on the bottom of it, as in uh, some kind of a style of crafting or, some, or, or steel, uh, almost like I said, uh, building blocks were put together. It just almost looked like it was put together in pieces. It, it wasn't one uh, smooth uh, bottom. It, it, you know, it's... Like almost like pipes, mm -hmm. is, is you know when you do it, putting your plumbing together. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to explain. It, it's like it tried to camouflage itself against the night sky, because you could tell it was black and metallic in color, but you could almost like it was trying to project the star field above it on the uh, on the underside. After subjecting Officer Stevens' photo to computer enhancement, no outline of the UFO could be defined. However, when the blurred streaks of light from camera movement are removed, the three brightest lights noted in Officer Stevens' sketch can be discerned in the photo. Only the centered light is skewed due to camera angle, which can be resolved when an illustration is superimposed over the photo. Both Lebanon Officer Barton and Milstadt Officer Stevens' sketches reveal an array of white light across the rear of the craft. One can theorize that the UFO's light sources are linked to some kind of propulsion technology. The question is, whose technology? The U.S. Air Force isn't claiming it. The UFO came to within one mile of Scott Air Force Base, and during the sighting, St. Clair Police Dispatch called Scott Air Traffic Control and asked if Scott could see the UFO. Scott Tower responded that they saw no UFO on their radar. Yet later, Scott personnel told newspaper reporters that they knew nothing about the UFO because their tower and radar were shut down. A very convenient and very unlikely story, especially since a military cargo plane was seen flying over the area only 15 minutes before. So why does the Air Force continue to deny all knowledge of UFO activity? I think the government's having the same trouble we are. And I think that maybe that's the reason they're not telling us much about it, because they can't explain it. That is one of the reasons, I think, that they may not be telling us. There are others. I think some of the other reasons that the government doesn't tell us is because the world isn't really ready for a complete explanation. Because the complete explanation is going to go email everywhere. And that's going to be a real shock to a lot of people their psyche, to their religious belief, to their sense of reality and who they are. 
Thanks to the Internet, individual civilians and UFO investigative organizations are posting a lot of information on the World Wide Web. One such organization is the National Institute for Discovery Science, or NIDS, based in Las Vegas, Nevada, which investigated the sighting and posted their complete report on the web. NIDS checked into every possible man-made hypothesis for the Illinois UFO. Theories included a so-called stealth blimp posted on a popular mechanics website and an Arion hybrid inflatable lifting body. Neither craft could be confirmed to exist, and they can be ruled out due to their inability to reach the speeds observed by witnesses. Also, such speeds would create g-forces in the tens of hundreds, which would damage both the airframe and the passengers. Because the UFO made little or no sound, we must turn away from conventional prop jet engine and rocket propulsion to consider a cutting-edge technology called electric propulsion. Jointly funded by the U.S. Air Force, pioneering EP research and development is underway at universities and aerospace engineering laboratories around the world in the production and testing of various types of ion and plasma thrusters. Atomic-based propulsion was researched in the United States in the 1950s, but as of the year 2000, the physics involved are still not totally understood or mastered, and the technology is still in its infancy. Leading engineers in the field have stated that the electrical power required to supply an electric propulsion engine capable of accelerating an aircraft the size of the Illinois UFO would approximate the total wattage of the entire United States power grid, or about 2,200 gigawatts. By comparison, a typical nuclear reactor produces at full output about one gigawatt of electricity. On October 24, 1998, Deep Space One, the first NASA satellite utilizing an ion engine as the primary propulsion source, was launched into orbit. This video is a test of the DS-1 engine prior to launch. The video utilizes time-lapse photography because the ion engine produces a gentle accumulative thrust over a period of time. Although various EP thrusters have been tested and used on satellites by the American and Soviet space programs since the 1960s, no American mission until Deep Space One has ever depended on electronic propulsion as the primary engine because of the concern that it would not work and a very expensive satellite would be lost. Even if the Illinois UFO had a lighter-than-air quality of a blimp, Electronic propulsion is not capable of accelerating an aircraft to 3,000 miles per hour in two to four seconds. Which takes us to hypothesis number two. NIDS presented a theory based around Puthoff's polarizable vacuum, in which local polarizable vacuum constants are modified via some unknown technology, thus inducing controlled acceleration fields. The physicist Alcubierre theorized in 1994 that space-time itself could be potentially modified, contracting space and time ahead of an object and expanding behind it, creating a warp-drive type jump through space. Yet once again, Puthoff, the proponent of the polarizable vacuum theory, said in 1997 at a NASA Breakthrough Propulsion Physics Workshop that such effects are beyond technological reach without some unforeseen breakthrough. Even in places like Area 51, it's doubtful that man has achieved that quantum leap. As a final hypothesis, some have suggested the Illinois UFO uses beamed microwave propulsion, magnetoplasma dynamics, and air spike technology. This theory contends that a ship using a helium-oxygen mix for buoyancy could collect beamed microwave energy onto a receiving rectenna from an orbiting satellite. This microwave energy is then converted to electric power, which is divided between superconducting electromagnets and the propulsion system. Propulsion would be supplied by ion engines and a newer concept called pulsed detonation propulsion. Here, the rectenna would focus microwaves to a detonation area where atmospheric air is superheated to explode creating plasma as thrust. Also, part of the microwave energy would be redirected forward of the craft, creating a superheated bubble of air 
or an air spike, which would deflect the shock wave and minimize air friction. Thus, the craft would appear to make a hyperjump acceleration. In 1997, Leek Mirabeau, an associate professor of mechanical engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, conducted a test of a new technology under the sponsorship of the United States Air Force and NASA at the U.S. Army's high-powered laser test facility at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. The technology being tested was beamed microwave propulsion. Mirabeau successfully launched a small craft 100 feet into the air. Designed by Mirabeau, the so-called light craft carried no onboard engine or fuel and was lifted into the air purely on a beam of invisible infrared light. Although the test was a phenomenal technical breakthrough, the craft was an experimental model, six inches in diameter, the size of a child's top. Mirabeau has himself stated that to apply this technology to a proposed full-scale aircraft of 66-foot diameter, it would take at least another generation. Anticipated delivery date is the year 2019. Why would the Air Force or some other government entity spend thousands of dollars in research and development in their own laboratories, working on technologies that would be considered inferior if they have already achieved the technology seen aboard the Illinois UFO? The most likely answer to that question is that the UFO seen over this area on January 5, 2000 was not man-made. In November of 1989, over northeastern Belgium, 140 witnesses, including eight police officers, saw similar triangular-shaped UFOs, and the objects sped away at incredible speed. In December of 1999, near Columbia, Missouri, the same objects were seen. If the Air Force or some other unknown government entity has achieved this technology, then they should be held accountable for their actions, for they intentionally flew at low altitudes over populated areas. Whatever the UFO was, it wanted to be seen. The only question that remains is who or what was at the controls. The saddest statement to be made regarding this remarkable sighting of January 5th is that while the lives of several witnesses have been heavily impacted by this event, only a select number of unknown individuals with the highest security clearances know if this was truly an alien craft. Perhaps the people of our planet would like to know if we're being visited by an alien race. <laughs>